It's 6.30. I hereby call this meeting to order. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll observe a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, it is my honor tonight uh, to introduce Dr. Irvin Clark. Dr. Clark is the president of Southern Crescent Technical College, and of course we have a brand new location of Southern Crescent Tech right in the heart of Peachtree City at the former Booth Middle School location. Welcome, Dr. Clark. Thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you for having me out today. I, I just want to first, before I start, I want to just introduce our Vice President for Institutional Research is here with me tonight, Dr. Chris Daniel. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Can you hear me okay now? That's better. Okay, thank you. Um, and then also, I just want to also congratulate the city of Peachtree City uh, and the mayor on your award yesterday at the uh, conference for the South Metro Outlook Economic Development Conference. I believe the city received an award, uh, Economic Development Award. So just congratulations on that and uh, well deserved. On thank all you so parts, much. Definitely. So again, uh, my name is Irvin Clark. I'm the proud president of Southern Crescent Technical College, and I really just want to provide you an update on what's going on at the college here in Fayette. We've had a lot of success over the past year, um, and just looking forward to just sharing updates with you and answering any questions that you have. Uh, so we're just going to focus on several things, our strategic plan, uh, enrollment data, our high demand industry sectors, apprenticeships, uh, talent strong, and about our capital outlay plan. Uh, Workforce development is really what our focus is at Southern Crescent Technical College. We are one of 22 technical colleges in the state. We are state owned. We are under the governor's office. Uh, within the framework of what we do, it's three tier, technical education, economic development, and adult education. That is our focus. Our technical ed courses focus on our credit programs. We offer associate degrees. We also offer certificates, and we offer, offer diplomas. We also have adult education, which we focus on GEDs and ESL, and we have economic development, which is our short-term training programs. This here is our strategic plan. It is the vision that I have for the next five years for Southern Crescent Technical College. Uh, we received input from community partners, uh, which include our K-12 partners, uh, as well as our industry partners, and our faculty and our staff and elected officials. And so this is a very comprehensive plan that provides us a framework for how the college is going to move, not just in Fayette County, but college-wide uh, in all of the counties that we serve. One of the things I just want to point out to you is goal number five, which is delivering highly relevant uh, programs. It is important that we stay nimble, that we are responsive to our industry partners, and that we align our programs with their needs. And so again, this plan is our framework for the next five years to help support uh, my vision for Southern Crescent Technical College. Uh, this here is our enrollment data. This is from last semester, and this enrollment data has changed, uh, but this is end of semester, fall of 2023. Uh, you see it's 5,800 students. Currently this semester, we have approximately 6,300 students enrolled at the college. We have the second highest enrollment increase amongst the 22 technical colleges. That number is up to about 18.4% uh, when you base that off of this time last year. Our dual enrollment numbers have also gone up. Uh, we are close to 2,050 students right now for the spring semester, but at the end of the fall, it was a little bit over 1,700. And our credit hours, which is the number of hours that students are taking with classes, is up about 15%. And that number has also increased for the spring. On the left-hand side, you'll see our high-demand sector programs. Uh, we have been tasked by the General Assembly as well as the governor to really focus on these high-demand industry sectors that are going to help support industries. Specifically, in Fayette County, our uh, advanced manufacturing programs and our allied health programs are critically important to help and support industries in this particular county. And so you can see that we've been laser-focused with that, with our advanced manufacturing program being up. 
about 47%, as well as our allied health programs. And you can see with LPN and registered nurse, that those numbers, as well as CNA, are also doing very well for the college overall and how we're responding to our industry partners um, and helping to put students into the workforce pipeline. This right here is a snapshot of uh, enrollment in terms of Fayette County specifically. Uh, you will see if I do enrollment numbers, uh, we had about close to 400 students who were enrolled in the program. 9% of our students make up uh, our total enrollment here in Fayette County, and that number is growing. It was around 6% last year, so we continue to grow. And really proud of the work that we're doing at the Fayette County Center, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later in the presentation. And we also have our adult education number, which includes both GED and ESL students, which is around 170 students. We work closely with uh, the Fayette County Chamber, with the Development Authority, also with Clayton State University, which we have a partnership with uh, at the Fayette County Center uh, for Southern Crescent Technical College and with Fayette County Schools and Dr. Patterson. These two uh, assets here uh, wanted to bring to your attention because you are likely going to see them in your city uh, with the companies that uh, we serve here in Peachtree City. Um, one is our industrial systems trailer, and this is a very valuable asset that's going to help us to provide training on site for a lot of the companies that you serve uh, and that we serve. Uh, a lot of companies have incumbent workers that need to be uh, upskilled in training. This could include PLC training, which stands for Programmable Logic Control Training, or safety training, or robotics training, or automation training. To be able to bring that training to a company on site and to be able to provide that training is going to be, value, is going to be very important and very valuable. Uh, this asset allows for us to move that train in the classroom into a parking lot area that's safe and secure. It's self-sufficient so it can run through diesel or through an electrical uh, connection that we can make. The other trailer is a welding trailer which also has the same capability. We can do everything in that trailer um, to provide uh, welding training, MIG, TIG, stick welding, as well as robotics welding um, in that trailer. Um, the great thing about these trailers is that uh, we can move them we can set them up, um, and they are classrooms that look just like our facilities in our on-campus locations. Same thing, and it also replicates the uh, manufacturing environment or the welding environment for a company. And so that's really important, and we're really proud of these assets. And so I'm sure that you will see them at some point, uh, hopefully uh, in a parking lot of a business as a company is getting training. This right here are two programs that we're doing. One is our CDL entrepreneurship program. Uh, it's a pilot that we're running to help support students who want to go into CDL. Could, uh, you, and could you describe what that is, CDL? Uh, commercial truck driving. Uh, commercial truck driving is CDL, and that's a, a high demand area in the state of Georgia. A lot of students uh, want to go into CDL, and with going into CDL, a lot of students want to become entrepreneurs. Most CDL drivers are contractors, and so teaching students about the technical side of CDL, but also the technical side of entrepreneurship is really important, making that connection. Entrepreneurs produce and create jobs, and that's what we want. And if they can create um, jobs in Peachtree City or in Fayette County and keep that money in the county and keep those jobs here and produce those jobs, that's important, uh, we believe, to help support um, this particular city and this county. On the other side is the LPN, the Paramedic to RM Bridge Program. Uh, it is a program that we launched uh, this past January. We're really proud to say that we now have nursing in Fayette County. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> the reason why that's so important is because Fayette County uh, residents would have to travel to our Upson campus or our Henry campus to be able to get nursing training. Um, and that was something that was not acceptable. Uh, we have a hospital here with Piedmont Fayette. They need a workforce, um, and we have a responsibility to provide that. And so now that we have this program, it is a bridge program. So if you have an LPN or you're a paramedic, <coughs> you can take this program. It's accelerated. Classes are offered on Saturdays. Uh, and so we have about 25 students that are in that cohort currently, and we've been approved for a second cohort pending um, uh, some data that we have to provide to the Georgia Board of Nursing, but we're really excited about it. And we just got word yesterday from 
uh, a funder that we are going to be receiving some simulation lab equipment for the campus here in Fayette. And so it's going to help us even expand our footprint more in terms of how we're going to train students uh, in nursing. So really excited about that opportunity to be able to support nursing in Fayette County. Dr. Clark, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, with what you're doing, it's all wonderful. Have you gotten the support of the healthcare community here in Fayette County to help you out? Yes, yes, we've gotten the support from uh, Piedmont Fayette, uh, the head of nursing. Uh, Ashley was very supportive in writing us uh, a letter and also very supportive in terms of our uh, uh, application to the Georgia Board of Nursing to expand this program. Uh, so we've gotten a lot of support from them. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. This here are just some pictures that are from that event, but the one thing I want to point out with this is that a part of that um, a part of that uh, initiative with bringing nursing to Fayette County is also the articulation agreement with Clayton State University and Gordon State. Students who attend Southern Crescent Technical College can articulate their credits to Clayton State or Gordon State to earn the BSN. Uh, and to also follow up on your question, that is something that Piedmont Fayette has asked us to focus on because they want to have uh, bachelor's level nurses. And so students can have that seamless transition in Fayette County. So they don't have to ever leave our campus. They can start with the ASN program with us and then transition over to the BSN at Clayton State, all here in Fayette County. Um, but they also have the opportunity to go to Gordon State as well too. This right here is our apprenticeship 2024. And the reason why I highlight this is because you're going to see a lot of the Fayette County companies um, receive information, uh, and I know they already are, but talk about this more. Apprenticeships are, are really a hot topic right now uh, in the U.S. for a lot of good reasons. The workforce challenges that companies are dealing with, obviously um, they're trying to figure out how to solve them. Apprenticeships have been very important in doing that. It's an earn, learn model that apprenticeships support um, the state. Um, and we're very grateful to the General Assembly as well to the governor for approving the High Demand Career Initiatives, which is a type of HDCI. It was $10 million that was set aside to help support high demand careers, such areas as advanced manufacturing, uh, allied health, cybersecurity. These are areas that uh, we are targeting with companies that need a workforce. Those dollars that the General Assembly and the governor have set aside allows for companies to be able to use that through apprenticeships to help support workforce development. Um, and so that's important. And they can take classes at Southern Crescent while they're in an apprenticeship program. In addition to that, apprenticeships also provide an opportunity for companies to upskill incumbent workers. So if they have someone who's in an entry level position or they want to move them up, they can utilize an apprenticeship as a way to do that. The college, as you know, um, has a number of programs and it just doesn't have to be advanced manufacturing, allied health, it can be in business. It can be in information technology, it can be in entrepreneurship, uh, it can be in transportation. So there's no limits to what we can do with apprenticeships and we have many funding opportunities to help support that. We also are asking companies to consider students who are in high school uh, in dual enrollment to think about apprenticeship opportunities as they cultivate talent and they build that pipeline for their company. This right here is our educator ed uh, externship program. Really grateful to Georgia Power, who uh, provided the college with a three-year grant uh, last year to help support um, this opportunity for us to be able to connect educators uh, with the technical college and with our industry partners uh, and with our development authority and chamber partners. Uh, the great thing about this is that it exposes K-12, to in this case, educators such as counselors or teachers to what we do at Southern Crescent Technical College. And so we can have a Fayette County teacher or counselor go to one of our industries and learn from them in terms of what goes on and then connect that to what we're doing on campus at Southern Crescent so they can see that connection and they can take that back and talk to students about what those connections mean. In addition to that, they're hearing from the Development Authority and from the Chamber to understand how we all work together to be able to support workforce development because we all have our roles to help support the industry partners and the communities that we serve. And so having teachers and educators hear about that, they get to see everything from the start in the middle and to the finish. And so we've had a lot of success with this program. We're gonna do it again this year. It's under a three year grant and just very appreciative to um, our uh, friends at Georgia Power for funding that program. 
Talent Strong is a program that we're focusing on. This is for uh, high school juniors. Uh, we are working with Fayette County Schools now to recruit a cohort. Um, this program is really geared towards helping to move young people into the pipeline of these very high demand industry sectors. Fayette County specifically has a need for machine tool, megatronics and industrial systems. I was actually with a company two days ago uh, talking to, uh, to them about uh, machine tool training that is a Fayette County company. Um, and because of that need and because of filling that workforce pipeline being so important, this program is going to help us facilitate that. Moving juniors who are in high school to begin to take classes with Southern Crescent Technical College under this particular plan, they'll be able to develop a career plan, take classes at our Fayette campus uh, with the intention of them working towards earning a TCC, which is a technical certificate of completion and a potential apprenticeship opportunity. And so working with companies, working with the school district to again to introduce students into these fields um, because we want our Fayette County companies to be able to see it, to see and grab that talent locally and cultivate that talent locally and not have to source that talent outside of the county um, because we have students who are interested in these fields. And just the last thing is our capital outlay project plan and this is just the RAM Center. This is a center that we are creating to help support advanced manufacturing. Fayette County will be a beneficiary of this because this center will help us to facilitate high level advanced manufacturing automation training um, for the college. Uh, one of the things about this is that the role of advanced manufacturing has changed uh, considerably over the past 10 years and even within the last five years. And automation is what drives a lot of manufacturing today. We call it clean manufacturing. And so to be able to provide a comprehensive center to help support that is going to be critically important. And so we're working right now to be able to get this approved and look forward to uh, when I come back to visit, um, if I'm able to, if I'm allowed to do that, then we can give you an update on the outcome of hopefully that request being approved. And Mayor, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council, any last questions? I have a quick question. So as a mom who has a junior in high school right now, she's actually taken um, some, a, a, some dual enrollment courses through, <coughs> through Southern Crescent. Oh, nice. Can you tell me um, what programs do you have here in Fayette County that students can take start to finish at that Fayette location? Yep. So a uh, couple programs. One, uh, civil engineering is a program they can take. Um, they can take nursing at the college. They can do CNA uh, at the Fayette Center. Uh, they can do uh, uh, EMS. Am I saying that correct, Chris? EMS, Emergency Medical Services, EMS program, which is a uh, TCC program. Uh, and they can do um, their general education courses, which is Early College Essentials, which is a degree program that we offer at the college for dual enrollment students. Um, and that is, that is it from what I can remember. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council. I think it, I think it's great that you're here. The mayor and I and several of the council members were at there grand opening we introduced oh, yeah. these mm -hmm. dual programs yeah. and they were really very very good yeah i think it's great that fayette county has got you here thank and you peachtree city is very fortunate to have you here thank you so much i appreciate it thank you thank you dr clark thank you so yes, much thank you dr clark we're blessed to have you thank you, thank you. Uh, next on our agenda we have recreation master plan update by cpl cindy bonacci Good evening, everyone. Great to see you all again. It's been a couple of months. Oh, sorry. It's been a couple of months. Um, as she said, um, my name is Cindy Bonacci. I'm with CPL, and just want to thank you for having me back. Um, to give you a little bit of an update of where we are with the master plan. I know everyone's eager to find out how it's going, when it'll be done. That's the big question. When will it be done? When will it be done? It's like Christmas. Um, 
but wanted to give you an update tonight primarily on where we are with the survey. Um, the survey is still open. Um, we elected as part of our agreement to have the survey stay open for five full months, but we've already pulled data and we're starting to use that data to start formulating some recommendations and move on with the process. So I just wanted to catch you up on where we are, show you some results, and uh, if you like data, this will be fun. If you don't, just bear with me till we get to the end. So uh, again, we picked um, a slogan for the survey called Your Parks, Your Say and you've seen that around. If you haven't taken the survey yet, like I said, it's still open, so we would welcome you to do that. So, here we go. Just as a reminder, this is your team um, for the master plan process. I'm Kevin McCumber is our senior executive vice president. He's our principal on the project. That's me, I'm your project manager, I'm former Parks and Recreation Director. I'm Matt Kane is our senior advisor and our senior uh, landscape architect on the project. And then Bob Betts is our Parks and Recreation spe Specialist. He'll be handling your gap analysis. And then you see all those other names, there are a host of people who are also supporting the project for you. So getting underway with the survey, um, we work with a company called Digital Media House. And about five years ago, um, when CPL was doing so many of these master plans, we really wanted to streamline the survey process um, and make it legitimate and make it um, data driven so that the data can be used by whatever um, client that we're working with. So Digital Media House worked with us to create a program um, just for our surveys and again that was about five years ago and they call it project surveys so when you see the poster that's on your right uh, out and about the town um, digital media house is the one that created our program software so the survey process um, we got started in October November of last year um, providing some drafts to staff uh, to get input on the questions and the format um, for the questionnaire uh, for the survey and we launched December 1st that was I think the day before hometown holiday um, which we were hoping to have a huge big crowd to interact with and unfortunately the weather didn't cooperate so well so it was a smaller crowd um, but we were still here and able to meet and chat with folks as they were waiting in line and coming in to see Santa for photos um, since then it's been on the website Facebook social media posters throughout the facility. There's one out in your lobby here, um, newsletters, email distribution. So hopefully by now the word has gotten out. If not, hopefully after tonight, if someone hasn't taken it, they'll go on and take it tonight. Um, we re retrieved the initial data. Um, we wanted to hit our benchmark. And once we hit our benchmark, we were able to pull the data. Um, but then we also pulled it again March 1st because I knew I was gonna come and be speaking with you. So um, the data that you're gonna see tonight is actually pulled from this past Wednesday. So it's only a couple of days old and our numbers have already gone up since Wednesday. So people are taking it daily. So the data, uh, the numbers change data, uh, day to day, but because we've surpassed the original number that we were hoping for, um, the data is pretty consistent across the board as to what trends we're starting to see. So, and then again, the survey will end April 30th. The way we set up the data and the way we set up the questionnaire is you can filter it um, by certain um, benchmarks. So residency, ethnicity, gender, age group, and number in household. So tonight you'll see that I've filtered some of it. Some of it is just raw data, um, but we can, we can talk through some questions that you have through the presentation at the end. Our initial survey goals were, of course, to receive maximum input um, through carefully crafted questions. Um, we've done enough of these now to know that there's something called survey fatigue. And when you, you know, you get that pop up on your phone or in your email, it says, hey, would you mind taking a few minutes to complete our survey? And then you're like five, 10, 15 minutes in, you're like, when does this end? And you don't even want to finish taking it. It's called survey fatigue. So when we design these, we set them up so that you'll be done in less than 10 minutes. And what we're seeing to date is the average time that it took to take the survey is between eight and nine minutes. So that's perfect. That's how we wanted it. Um, our goal was to receive at least 1,900 responses in the five month period, which is a 5% response rate based on your population. Um, we hit that 1,900 number about mid to late February. So we've already achieved that goal that was supposed to take us five months. So we've already checked that box. 
um, there are no duplicates. We have a filtering software that goes through the survey responses to filter out any duplications. And so the data that you see and the data that you'll be provided at the end of this process, there will be no duplicates in there. So, um, and then there's representation, of course, across all demographics. That was, of course, our goal. So we'll start with some of the data. I uh, apologize if some of these may be a little small, but I'll try to walk you through what you're seeing. So obviously the survey is open to anyone um, in Peachtree City outside. So this is the numbers that we're at today. Um, we are actually, uh, we were at 2,105 responses as of Wednesday morning. We're at 2,110 as of this afternoon when I left my office. Um, so we've had five people take the survey since Wednesday morning, but that's a daily ongoing thing as people, as people take it, that number changes. But tonight what I'm going to show you are the results of just Peachtree City residents. And some of you might be wondering why would we want to hear from people who live outside of Peachtree City. For a variety of reasons, you have people, your neighbors come in to participate in programs, they come in to utilize facilities, they have family here. Some of them may be some of your staff who work here and spend a good bit of time here in Peachtree City. So those extra um, numbers that you see for non-residents are also very valuable, but tonight we're just gonna focus on your resident responses. Okay, and this again, um, looking at ethnicity, about 72% of the respondents are Caucasian. You can see the breakdown of the others. Um, there is a prefer not to identify option in the survey. Um, that could be uh, an other category if you think of it that way, and they just didn't feel comfortable or want to classify themselves into one of the ethnicities that were on the survey. This is gender. Um, historically, anytime we do a survey, women tend to take more surveys than men do. Um, so that is typical that we see that there's always a higher response rate from females uh, than there are males. This is the breakdown by age group. Um, as some of you may remember, uh, one of our options when we presented our approach to the survey was to include the schools. Um, we typically try to do that in any community that we're working in because we want to actually hear from the children. It's great to hear from parents and typically their wants and needs are aligned, but sometimes it's great just to hear from the children. So um, what we typically do is target fourth grade and 10th grade. Um, fourth graders are typically just getting involved in recreation um, and they're excited and they're figuring out what they love doing. And by 10th grade, they have phased out of a lot of those early sports they participate in. They're either burnout or maybe they didn't make the high school team, so they've just kind of given up on athletics. And they're looking for other things to, to get involved in to, to meet their interests. So fourth and 10th grade is what we target. Um, when we proposed this, though, um, the local schools did not really want to participate. Um, and you can see that's somewhat unfortunate because that's typically where our numbers come from in the younger age groups. So when you see those numbers, you're like only that many kids participated, it's because we were not able to get into the schools. Um, so I've talked with Kathy already about different options we may have this spring to try to really pick up on some of the kids um, weighing in on what they're looking for, what they like, what they don't like um, to kind of keep them busy. So that is something that is unfortunate um, about the survey responses, but we're gonna try to see if we can get that input um, before the process is over, so. How do you rate your satisfaction um, with the existing parks and recreation facilities? Um, it's great because a large majority said they were satisfied. Um, others said they were neutral. Um, where I think Peachtree City wants to be is in the very satisfied category um, with parks and recreation. Um, that's kind of everybody's goal. They wanna be in that top category, very satisfied or satisfied. Um, the neutral responses um, are kind of open-ended and can leave some questions. Are they just not saying because they don't care or are they not saying because they don't wanna misrepresent something? So the neutral is always a little bit of a question mark, but um, even going back um, to when we did our stakeholder interviews and we kind of talked about the condition of things and, and what people's expectations were. And one of my questions was, do you feel 
that the facilities and programs in Peachtree City are adequate. And the response was, yes, they're adequate, but they're not Peachtree City standard. Um, so that just leaves a little bit of room for improvement, and that's okay. Um, but I just want to kind of point that out as we go through. This is ranking in the order of importance um, what's most important to folks when they're out and about in your parks. Um, the number one response was personal safety. Uh, second response was maintenance and appearance. And then third was the variety of parks and facilities. Um, and so that was kind of across all age groups, all ethnicities, those were the top choices. On average, how often do you or your family member visit a playground? I know you have um, several playgrounds, lots, um, 20 plus actually, um, available in your community. So the never response was kind of expected looking at uh, a large population of older adults that participated in the survey. They may not need to go to a playground because they don't have kids playground age. But I just wanted to show this um, as well uh, as we get into it and when you get the data and you can filter it the way you want, you can kind of break it down by childbearing age group parents um, and see kind of where those numbers fall with how often they're visiting playgrounds. That's kind of a better one to look at per age group. And then on average, how often do you and your family members visit a facility? Uh, again, being able to look at this by age group and being able to filter it um, is going to kind of tell you a little bit more. but. Okay, do you have children or youth between the ages of five and 17? 54% uh, um, said yes. So, or excuse me, 54% said no. So that just shows that we're either above or below um, the age group for the parents um, who have kids that are actually participating in the programs. Um, how do you rate the current children youth programming offered by the city? Um, again, you kind of see the breakdown, satisfied, neutral. Um, there's unsatisfied, um, then there's some I don't participate, and then uh, the very satisfied is kind of near the bottom. Um, again, back to the kind of what we talked about earlier is there's lots of offerings here, and yes, they're adequate, and most people are satisfied, but there's definitely room uh, to kind of take that up a notch here and kind of be more of what a Peachtree City expectation would be. You definitely want to be, have your very satisfied kind of move up that chart a little bit. Are you an adult between ages 18 and 55? And 66% of the respondents are. How do you rate the current adult programming offered by the city? Again, there's that neutral response. Um, we like people to either be hot or cold. Neutral is kind of that in between. We don't know how to kind of deal with them. Um, and then we have a huge response of, I do not participate in adult programming. Now there could be a lot of reasons for that, but what is it going to take to kind of get people more involved? What is missing from the offerings or the facilities that are going to get that adult population more involved in the community? Are you a senior over 55? And I know some people go, wait a minute, 55, that doesn't mean a senior, but that's, that's typical, <laughs> typical age group classification for uh, senior adults. So, um, and 34% said yes. and how do you rate the current senior programming offered by the city? Again, of those seniors, of that 34% response rate, um, a large majority do not participate in any senior programming. And again, some of them may say, hey, I'm only 56, I'm not a senior, so I'm not doing that. But um, trying to figure out maybe why they're not involved, um, offering some additional programs and facilities that would appeal to that older population a little bit more to get them more involved in the community. Which of the following items prevent you from using existing parks and rec facilities? Um, and the number one response was that what they're looking for is not currently offered. So, and when you think about that, Peachtree City kind of has a little bit of everything. Um, so trying to figure out what it is they're looking for that's not here and why do they feel they have to go elsewhere for that? Um, so that was a little bit surprising knowing the vast list of programs and facilities that are here. 
and trying to figure out what's missing. Which options would you prefer to raise funds for parks and recreation facilities? Um, number one, obviously, is SPLOST. Um, number two is to create tournaments and special events that will increase revenue. And then the third response was to increase non-resident fees. So that would be something to explore, not only non-residents of Peachtree City, but non-county residents as well. What amount would you be willing to pay per year per household? There's two ways to look at this. Yes, half of them say they would not support it, but there's another way to look at it, half of them would. And what would half of them support? And half of them say that they would support up to a $50 per year, per household fee, just for parks and recreation. So if you do some high level math real quick here, let's just say there's 15,000 homes in Peachtree City and $50 a household, you're looking at about $750,000 a year just for parks and recreation that your community, at least half of them have said that they would support. So again, just throwing that out there. Do you leave Peachtree City to participate in recreation programs? I also thought this was very surprising. 41% of the respondents say they actually leave Peachtree City to go elsewhere to participate in programs. Um, so figuring out, that's pretty high, especially for what Peachtree City has to offer. So figuring out what's gonna keep them here, what changes can be made to try to allow residents to participate right here in their own community. And this kind of, again, um, echoes why they're leaving. And it's the top two choices are programs and facilities are not offered by the city. Okay, so here I did some summaries for you. Um, on some of the questions, there were a lot of choices to pick from. These are the top 10 uh, recreational facilities, parks and greenways that received the most responses. So typically in every community, trails, walking, bicycle trails are gonna be number one. Um, number three was event festival fields, open play areas, obviously your amphitheater, swimming pools, outdoors, playgrounds for ages six to 12, um, which is kind of a hard age group to meet. We think of playgrounds, we think of the younger ones, but the six to 12 year olds want a place to play as well. Um, rec center, gymnasium, indoor multi-use courts, swimming pools indoors, um, canoe, kayak launch, and football across multi-purpose fields. Those were your top 10. And this was across all age groups. Cindy, top 10 in, as far as what they use and enjoy or what they want and Correct. This is what they are currently using and what is most important to them in Thank the you. community. These are the top 10 passive activities um, from the survey. Again, walking, hiking, canoe, kayaking, arts, crafts, ceramics, which I thought was quite interesting, biking, theater, performance, cooking classes, jogging and running, nature study and watching, dog walking and activities, and gardening. Top 10 special events, number one, across all age groups, farmers market, uh, Fourth of July parade and fireworks, food and drink festivals, holiday events, Fred Brown amphitheater concerts, arts and crafts festivals, Shake Rag arts and crafts festivals, a concert series, fall festival and movie night, and hometown holiday were the top 10. Here I broke it down a little differently because we're getting into active recreation. Um, the top 10 um, active activities uh, from the survey are number one is pickleball. <laughs> I figured that might get a response, but. Um, Number one is pickleball, two is golf, soccer, summer camps, basketball, baseball and softball, tennis, swim team, disc golf, and mountain biking. And I broke this down by age group just to show the differences um, across the different age groups. So ages eight to 17, volleyball is number one, skateboards and bikes, football, sand volleyball, and swim team. Ages 18 to 25, indoor soccer, pickleball, mountain biking, skateboard and bikes, and soccer. Then when we get into that middle age group category, soccer, summer camps, baseball, softball, basketball, and swim team. Why do we think people ages 26 to 45 want those things? 
kids. They're kids, yeah. absolutely. So ages 46 to 65 and ages 65 plus are very, very similar in what their responses were. Pickleball, golf, disc golf, tennis, mountain biking. And then in the older category, um, there's number three is other. So other will be defined, um, if you've taken the survey, you know there are a few open-ended questions. So if you mark other, you're actually able to write in exactly what you want to say. So we have to qualify and quantify all of that data separately, and we do that manually. So we'll actually tell you what that other represents on that 65 plus age group when we get to the end. Okay, so next steps for the master plan. Um, what we've done so far, um, we had to have three basic processes that happen during a master plan. We evaluate what you have, which is inventory, data collection. We look at maps, we look at aerials, we look at um, all of your previous plans. We evaluate all of that during the data collection process. Then we look at your inventory. And your inventory here in Peachtree City is massive. Um, we're looking at every field, every facility, every playground, everything. Um, and then we rate that. We give it a, a score of um, excellent down to poor. Um, and so we are in the process of charting all of that right now. Um, we've had three of our staff members come down and do the inventory over the last couple months. So the next step after we catalog all of that inventory is the gap analysis, which is getting started now. Uh, following the gap analysis is a needs assessment. Um, we're getting into what do you want, which is the survey that we have. So what do you have? What do you want? Next steps are what do you need? And so that's where we are right now with the gap analysis, needs assessment, the final survey data review. Again, this will stay open through the end of April. So at the end of April, we'll pull the final data, compare it to the data that we've been using up until that point and make sure that the trends are equivalent. Um, we will make recommendations. Um, we will have an opportunity for public input, staff input, along the process of reviewing our recommendations. Then we get to the final report and final plan, and then obviously it comes back before you for adoption. And hopefully at that point, it is a living, breathing document that will serve the city for at least the next 10 years and, um, and kind of guide decisions. I was telling somebody earlier, um, if you've ever gotten in your car and turn on the ignition and start driving, but you don't know where you're going, uh, that's kind of like trying to operate without a plan. Um, this plan will kind of be your GPS. It'll tell you where you need to go, how you're gonna get there, and that kind of thing, so that you're not just idling around, wondering what do we do next kind of thing. So I'm open to any questions that you may have. Um, we are very excited to have gotten this project. I mean, you have a jewel of a city here. It's been so, um, exciting to learn more about it, to get down into the weeds of the city and um, really see how it came to be uh, and learn as much as we can about it. So again, we want to thank you for allowing us to be part of this. Cindy, could you talk about time frame on those remaining things yes. that are yet to be done? So let me go back. Oh, sorry. So next steps, the gap analysis is starting now. So um, Kathy and staff are going to be sent an inventory list pretty soon, probably as early as next week, to review and make sure we have not missed anything in the inventory. Um, if we have, she'll correct that, get that back to us, because the inventory is critical when we do the gap analysis. The gap analysis, if you don't understand what that is, it is kind of benchmarking. We look at national standards for cities your size, gives us kind of an idea and a starting point of what you may be deficient in. But during that process and during the needs assessment, we will identify what's considered a Peachtree City standard. So just because there's a national standard doesn't mean it's applicable here in Peachtree City. Obviously, you're a very unique community. You have got park paths. That's not typical throughout many of the cities your size. So we want to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples. So the needs assessment will identify that Peachtree City standard um, throughout the recommendations process as well. So that is starting now, needs assessment. Final survey data review, that'll happen when the survey closes April 30th. We'll go back and relook at all the data that we've been using from the public at that point. Um, following that, the recommendations will come, uh, then the final report plan and adoption, and my hope is to be done by June, July at the absolute latest for adoption for you. Council questions? Cindy, <coughs> excuse me, Cindy, are these slides available? 
Uh, yes, Kathy has seen them. I know I've presented them to Justin on a staff level. What I was showing Kathy earlier is, and I, the, the city, you guys have a copy of this presentation if you want to get access to it. Um, what I was showing Kathy earlier is Digital Media House, who creates these project surveys for us, has given me access to go in and see live data anytime I need to. So we haven't done that before with a community, and I have to figure out how that's going to work so I can turn it over to the city. Um, but that way you can go in and you can literally click a button and filter the data however you need to see it by age group, by ethnicity, by resident, non-resident. So I was showing Kathy that before the meeting that that's not something we've typically had before. And so when we are done in April, I'm hoping to provide that data once the data is complete so that the city can use it however they need to to be able to filter it and look at specific age groups and things. So I understand. I understand. Well, I was just looking for things like this, the next steps and those kind of things. Yes. The data is your data right now. It's nice to see it, but well, I'm not going to get my hands in. I want to see it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Any other questions, Council? Yeah, I have one. Um, is there a point in where you're working on this that a citizen advisory <coughs> committee would get incorporated into it to have mm -hmm. any kind of like sharing information or have like, almost like an advanced set of um, citizen advisory people to look at the data with you in conjunction as you're putting everything together. Um, we have utilized historically um, quite a few different citizen committees mm -hmm. that are put together to try to have that component. We have a lot of really great experts in certain areas and they're, they're just chomping at the bit to get involved. Yes. So, so a couple, couple of responses to that. Um, Back in January, we did stakeholder interviews, and what the city staff recommended, I know all of you were part of the interview process, and spent about 45 minutes with me um, back in January. So we had stakeholder groups um, that represented a lot of the organizations in the city, and they were able to give us input into the process. So that data is looked at separately from the survey data. So we have all of the stakeholder data that we are also evaluating. We've already summarized those, tallied them up, uh, initially right after I think we had our stakeholder interviews, I think there was a work retreat or something, and so I sent a preliminary list of summaries to Kathy so she had those and could speak to those responses with you at that work retreat. But mm -hmm. yes, so stakeholders um, were part of the process back in January. We have all of that data we will review. When we get to recommendations, as I've mentioned to Kathy, we can come back and do kind of an open house, a public forum, so that you can see the recommendations, where we got them from, and make comment on those at, before we get to the final report stage. Okay. Uh, Councilwoman, if I can also add to that. So part of the plan that we had to design some citizen advisory groups uh, for the city in general, and I identified a few of those a couple of months ago, and we can talk about that, was one specific for REC, uh, to talk a little bit about what happens after this process comes into play. So uh, Cindy and CPL are doing all the forklift heavy moving here and they're going to make a recommendation based on their expertise in the industry and once that data comes back to us and we start looking at how we can implement this, I find it easier and, and more beneficial to the resident advisory groups to help us move those projects along after we get the data consolidated back from the vendor. So there is definitely a plan to bring that forward. Uh, but right now, I think the important part of it is to let them finish the work that they're doing so we have a clean slate of exactly how we want to go to that next level for recreation. Okay. Questions, Council? Yeah, I have one quick question. This may sure. be something that our recs department might already be aware of, but when you are evaluating what we already have, do you also look at the viewpoint from ADA and accessibility for wheelchairs and what's needed and do you report that back to us? Yes. Where so, can be improved? so we start out doing aerials of each facility and we start out with aerials and we take those aerials on site. So we've had three different staff members come down and do evaluations. One of them, luckily, when he was on site, found a freeze break at the Fred <laughs> while he was out doing his tour. He's like, oh, there's water gushing everywhere. So, so we have been in your facilities. We've been touring them indoor, outdoor um, to take a look at those. And we are looking at ADA accessibility issues with that and how those can be accommodated or if that's even possible at some of the facilities due to the age. So. Mr. Holland. Uh, first of all, I think the report looks good so far. 
Um, one of the things I have to echo from uh, a previous council person talking about it is getting input from the citizens. Mm -hmm. And I heard you say, oh, we got stakeholders. Stakeholders are one type of group, but getting the average Joe or Jane involved mm -hmm. does give you a different perspective. Um, I listen to a lot of the citizens who have said to me, we used to play nighttime baseball here. Softball, I should say, not baseball, softball. But uh, we now play in other cities. And that may be part of what you're seeing with people leaving right. because I know I played softball until I got too old to play it. But it was a lot of fun and I played it probably till I was almost 50 years old. Right. So I see that as one, you call them gaps. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think you might get some input if you go to the rank and file citizens here and maybe that committee. Yeah. That would be just one recommendation that I would throw out there for you to consider. And that is the whole point of the survey process, right. is to allow anyone in the city, all age groups, all demographics, to participate. And so that's why we wanted to leave it open. Um, five months is usually, it's, it's pretty long for us. Typically, most jurisdictions want to leave it open two to three months at the, at the latest. But we're leaving it open five months because we really, truly want to hear from everyone. And the whole point of that is so that when we are making recommendations, everybody feels like they had an opportunity to be heard. Thank you. Sure. All right, council, any last questions? Oh, Thank you, Cindy. We sure look forward to whatever comes next. Thank you. Can't Thank wait you, to see. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, announcements, awards, special recognition. Just as a matter of information, since Dr. Clark mentioned it, yesterday, uh, Councilmember Holland and I and, and Jasmine Julia went up to the South Metro Development Outlook Conference. It's an annual uh, economic development conference <coughs> that involves dozens and dozens of Southside communities. And um, Peachtree City was awarded the Economic Development Award. I think it was due to our, our job creation, our infrastructure improvements, our policies that are favorable to industries and to industry expansions. And of course, it's all due to our, our success in recently recruiting hundreds of new jobs to Peachtree City is due to our partnerships with the Fayette County Development Authority, with GDOT, with our industries, even with uh, private economic, uh, excuse me, private commercial real estate companies, and of course with Southern uh, Crescent Technical College. So it was a high honor indeed to accept an economic development award at an economic development conference. And the award itself is in the display case in the lobby right next to our communication department's three Tully Awards. So. Congratulations. Yes, Thank thanks you. very much. I, have, I just have one comment. It was well received by the mayor. She did a great job uh, talking about how wonderful our city is and how many things. But what really got me was other people around the south suburbs of Atlanta, the south metro area, were very jealous of Peachtree City getting this because they do some things, but not at the level that this this group does and allows in our city. So it's really quite an award to get because there are a lot of very envious and jealous people out there that would like that award next year. Thank you. Uh, public comment. Yes, we have seven individuals signed up to speak. The first person signed up is Altai Nagati. Can we get the lights up, please? Good evening. Mayor, City Council, citizens, uh, thank you for to hear me for just five minutes, whatever the time is. Three. Anyway, so my name is Altai Negati. My wife is here, Susan Negati, and I've been in Peachtree City since 2001, and uh, right now our residence is in uh, Plantera Ridge. Uh, I own a company who I'm importing Swiss wine. Um, on the near future, I'm going to need a warehouse. So this is where I thought about something that can actually be helpful for Petri City and for the pickable people is that on the warehouse, I would like to split it and make an <coughs> indoor pickable with about 18 pickable courts with one central court. So what's going to do being indoor it's going to reduce the reasons for the citizens and uh, the neighbors because it's going to be inside. Uh, it's going to be all weather, so you can play when it's hot, rain, whatever. And on top of that, 
uh, with the central court, and if you get more than 16 pickable courts, you can actually attract the PPA, Professional Pickable Association, the USPPA, to actually do, we can host tournaments, uh, professional tournaments. What's going to do that is going to actually increase revenue to uh, Petrie City uh, uh, for the hotels, for the restaurants, and, and so forth. Uh, another thing to my company, actually, uh, right now, I'm a platinum uh, sponsor uh, for the uh, for the Fred. So this is one thing because I do believe uh, to be part of the community and to make it better. So anyway, so I wanted to say so if I can establish my warehouse on a site building a indoor pickable uh, courts, I think that's going to be very helpful for everybody. And thank you for listening to me. Any thank questions? You. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next person to sign up to speak is John Riley. Mayor, Council, my name is John Riley. I'm also known as Pac Pac to uh, some of your staff for reasons which will become uh, pretty evident here shortly. Uh, I live at 109 Heritage Way in the retreat subdivision directly behind the Brayland Rec Center pickleball courts. I'm here tonight to once again raise awareness regarding pickleball noise and to ask for your help. As the days get warmer and longer, I can feel my stress level and that of my neighbors rising. Warmer, longer days means more pickleball noise earlier and longer. I stood before the SWAS committee in this room two years ago and described the noise as pock pock, pock pock, pockety pock, expletive pock pock. I spoke here six months ago on this subject and likened the sound to that of your neighbor re-roofing their house all day, every day. Anecdotally, both descriptions are pretty good, but I'd like to quantify that noise tonight. I know we have a couple of engineers on council and thought they would appreciate that. I am not an engineer, so I will quote one. Any numbers you hear from me tonight will come from a gentleman named Bob Unetic. Bob is a professional pickleball referee and a sound engineer. He has a vested interest in the sport and helps organizations locate their courts in such a way as to prevent a noise nuisance. The standard decibel level for background noise in a neighborhood is 40 decibels. The sound created by pickleball, the sound of ball and paddle, is measured at 70 decibels at 100 feet from the court, 30 decibels louder. Not even twice as loud, right? Well, unfortunately, the decibel scale is logarithmic. Every 10 decibel increase is twice as loud as the previous value. So 40 to 50 is twice as loud. 50 to 60 is four times as loud. 60 to 70, eight times as loud. We're hit by a repetitive, high-pitched noise eight times as loud as normal background noise, accompanied by screams and yells. Those screams and yells come in at 80 to 90 decibels, by the way. That's annoying, and that is a noise nuisance. By comparison, tennis comes in at 40 decibels. Free freeway noise comes in at 70 decibels, the same as pickleball. This is the sound intruding into our properties, making our backyards, decks, and patios unusable. I am unable to enjoy a cup of coffee in the morning, a beverage or dinner in the afternoon or the evening because of it. The sound intrudes into the bedrooms and living rooms of my neighbors closest to the courts. I've had overnight guests woken up by the noise at my house. This is not an attack on pickleball. My wife and I play. I'm looking at a number of people here that I played with today, so it's nothing bad about them. We're members of the pickleball club. To their credit, the club understands the issue. They even advised Fayetteville that they were locating their courts too close to residences. However well-intentioned, the Braylon courts are too close to our homes, and no amount of screening, natural or man-made, will mitigate that. I'm asking that the city build more courts where they don't intrude on citizens' homes and close the Braylon pickleball courts as soon as possible. Please remove the freeway from our backyards, protect our property values, and Thank give us back our comment. Peachtree City way of life. We don't want to go through this another summer. I would welcome the opportunity to speak with any of you individually or as a group to discuss this further. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. The next person signed up to speak is Scott Larson.
Good evening. Uh, honestly, I didn't know pickleball people would be here tonight, and uh, it, it looks like we're going to talk a, a little bit about pickleball. But, but I live closest to the pickleball courts, and I, I feel that, you know, if I didn't speak, someone would say, well, you know, what about Larson? He lives over there. He's not complaining. So uh, that, I just took the opportunity to come in and really and support John and what he says. He's, he's, tech, he's my next door neighbor, one of my next door neighbors. My family and I moved here uh, about 26 years ago. We moved into the retreat. Uh, it's a great neighborhood. I served as the, as the HOA president for six or seven years. And when my daughters, after about 20 years, were out of school and on their way, uh, my wife and I decided to downsize or right size. And because we liked the neighborhood so much, we were lucky enough and we stayed in the neighborhood. We got a ranch over on Heritage Way, which right behind the pickleball courts. And uh, I, I, I moved there, you know, some people say, well, you should have never moved there. Well, the pickleball courts were there four years later, I think. Um, I built a brand new deck on the backside, which faces it. My, my uh, master bedroom, uh, main bedroom uh, faces it, as does the, uh, as the, the uh, main uh, guest uh, bedroom. And, and like John says, from spring to fall, when the weather's nice, those balls fly. It's amazing. Uh, last year, I invited a couple of folks. I said, and, and you folks are welcome to come to my house anytime you want, sit in the back deck on a weekend day, like Mike King did last year, and said, those things really do have to go. Um, John talks about decibels. I don't know decibels real well, but I will tell you, when you have six courts going at the same time, you almost forget they're playing pickleball and you think it's one huge mean ping pong ball game. And that gets a little old after a while. Um, so it gets old to me, it gets old to my wife who's long term ill, of course that has no, not because of pickleball, but she, she's in that bedroom a lot and uh, it doesn't help her out at all either. So I think I, think I said enough. Uh, again, nothing against pickleball, but I sure would like to see another location Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, Next person signed up to speak is Lloyd Smith. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor, Council, and City Manager. We've heard a lot of varying talk tonight. Some, let's build more inside. Let's get rid of some. Um, I originally came here to talk about the lack of training facilities in Peachtree City for pickleball. But I've heard from our uh, recreational master plan that pickleball is the number one uh, uh, sport for people in our age or older. We have people who are playing this game at 90 years old. <clears throat> we have many people playing in through late into their 70s and early 80s. This is a game, and why it's so it's, it, it is so well received because it's an easy game to learn to play. You can play it at all levels. You can play it at all age groups. Um, men play with women. And there are many women out here who are supporting pickleball tonight that beat me every day I play with them. <laughs> they give no quarter, they ask no quarter because they can play on an equal basis and win. We talked about people traveling to other cities. Absolutely. Our pickleball players travel to Noonan. They travel to Griffin. And when they do, they're stopping to buy gas, groceries, have lunch, have dinner, and we're losing that revenue in Peachtree City. This is something I don't think we should be doing. We ask, uh, um, how can we support this? Well, we said special events. Pickleball can bring in a great deal of money on special events. Many communities do so. They charge 70, 80, 90 dollars to play. They get 200 people playing. That's a lot of money to bring in for a two day event. We can do that. So um, I do need at a later date to come back and talk about training facility, but I will wrap that up just to tell you that we need your support. We saw on the master plan that pickleball is important to a large group of people. We don't support it here at Peachtree City at this point in time, but we need to. This, this game is in its infancy, and it's gonna grow, and it's gonna grow here. 
We have a club right now with just over 800 members. That, I believe, is the largest club in Georgia, and we're growing, and we need your support. And uh, so thank you. Thank you. Next person signed up to speak is Cheryl Averill. Good evening. I'm Cheryl Averill. I'm a Peachtree City resident and have been so for over 13 years now. My husband and I and my two children moved here in 2010. And over the 13 years, we have loved all the amenities and parks and rec opportunities that we've had. My children are adults and out of the house, but we participated in things in parks and Kendron Fieldhouse and Daddy Daughter Dances and you name it. We have participated and loved them. So I'm here tonight to speak as a citizen, obviously as a pickleball player and someone who loves the sport, and as a volunteer, currently volunteer on the board of the PTC Fayette Pickleball Club as a VP of Communications. So I, was, came, I came tonight really hoping to learn more about the Parks and Rec plan. It was a wonderful presentation. There were many opportunities that stood out there, and I would like to, again, express my interest in working with the council to provide the most opportunities for our citizens throughout the county. So one thing that stood out on the survey was that you had pickleball listed as a number one sport from 18 to 25, 25 to 45, 65 plus. You said that, we also said that people are leaving the county because they don't have the opportunity for certain sports. One thing that also stood out was the eight to 17 year old group. Not only is pickleball the fastest growing sport in the country, the youth program is skyrocketing. So we have the pro pickleball tour and we now have a junior PPA tour where kids are coming on tour from 10 to 17 and they have started their sports career, so to say, with pickleball as the racket sport. They used to come from tennis. A lot of times they'd play tennis, they'd go through high school, college. If they couldn't make it beyond college, they tried pickleball and they've been quite successful. The PPA Tour is coming here in May up at Lifetime Fitness Center. Um, as Lloyd mentioned, if we had a larger court facility, we could attract PPA back here again. Of course, you know they were here about three years ago with the top players in the world right here in Peachtree City. It's a wonderful event. Um, that being said, um, when we consider parks and rec programs, when I look at the summer program, we have all kinds of programs that are offered for all age levels and several which are sponsored by leagues or individuals. My request is that the parks and rec program consider letting the pickleball club offer instruction. We are certified. We have health certifications. You allow events to be rented at the Kedron facility. You allow recreational leagues to run soccer and to run hockey organizations. We would like to work with you to offer the pickleball program you have a junior summer tennis camp program being offered this year, but there's a huge opportunity missing for pickleball. We would love to partner with instructional programs for all ages of the citizens of the community. And your parks and rec program has glaring holes that are sitting in that survey that show that those programs would be supported. Um, also, I would like to um, ask for an update and to work with you to provide factual information to the over 800 members of our club regarding SPLOST. I know we're, there was consideration to tear down the log house courts and add those courts to a bigger facility for an 18 structure. Benefits of that, of course, would be to attract tournaments and revenue, which also your citizens said was the number two reason they would uh, support a fee for the recreational programs. They would like to earn that through either splash generated funds or through tournaments and recreational play. That again would support that and hopefully satisfy the residents who are um, not enjoying the noise from the game. So I thank your you for your consideration and have a good evening. Thank you. Your Thank you. Next person sign up to speak is Holly Maestas. Good evening. Uh, my name is Holly Maestas. I am a homeowner and uh, my children go to school in Peachtree City. I work in Peachtree City and uh, thank you for your public service. Um, I'm here to talk about two things. Um, neither of them are pickleball, um, but I'm gonna have to try pickleball now. Um, <laughs> I wanted to talk about the ordinance for uh, special events and media and production permits. So the filming ordinance that just came out in May um, and the way it's impacted um, me and my neighborhood and on the street that I live in. Um, the current ordinance gives residents three days notice um, and that's before the actual filming starts. Um, the notice that was given to the city when I did an open records request came way before that. Um, and so I'm asking for greater notice, um, the first notice that comes to the city, if the residents can be notified of that um, so that we can get in, as a part of that process before it's too late. Once the, 
once the production company has gotten into contracts with the resident that's filming the house at their house and also in a contract with the HOA, um, it's too late. They are heavily invested and then we don't find out about it until we're three days into before a police block that is blocking us from getting into our neighborhood. We had hundreds of contract workers who I'm sure are not background checked, background checked by their own company. We had 50 plus vehicles. This lasted for several weeks over 2023 and 2024. We had huge vehicles that were parked. The porta potty trailer sat for several weeks right um, aside where my children play football by the gazebo on the green space. Um, this was the uh, Matt and Emily's house for 1000 Legacy Drive for the Netflix film with Jamie Foxx and Cameron Diaz. We never saw them, but we did see all the contract workers. Um, so earlier notice and um, somehow limits to the number of permits that are granted in that same area because the same resident had announced that she was about to enter into a new contract with HBO for a series. Um, and of course, that's residentially and residentially zoned and covenanted. Um, the second issue I want to talk about is traffic calming on McDuff and Franklin Ridge. There was a child that was airlifted on. There was a child that was airlifted. Ma'am, we'll if you can you stand over to this other. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. There was a child that was airlifted in November of 2022 at Franklin Ridge and McDuff. My children and myself were almost hit um, twice in the month of March. I'm afraid to cross the street at Franklin Ridge and McDuff, and I'm afraid with my children are playing basketball on the driveway because the, the traffic Thank is you too fast. Comment. You can finish. Um, I'm currently collecting data from my neighbors, and also I'm on the agenda to speak to my HOA on Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next person sign up to speak is Tom, Todd Weinreb. Evening, everybody. This is an easy one. I just wanted to come out here and publicly thank City Council uh, for looking after us over the Kedron Hills neighborhood and closure of that cart path is um, a microphone is a microphone on that better no. yes All right. thank you no problem so I want to thank the City Council for you know for upholding the prior administration's decision on closing that road um, that was opened in 2022 uh, to golf carts um, the one thing I would like to, to to ask is that every time that comes back up and kind of you know email start or you know post start is we get a lot of harassment in our neighborhood about that we get called xenophobic we get called all kinds of terrible names and it starts all over and feels like we have to get in this process um, you don't hear a lot from our residents because they figure it is just kind of done and it's just already set in motion so they're not harassing you know city council because they figure it's already completed um, I was very surprised to find it it was the young lady's parents that started up the conversation again considering that we have been over backwards I think as a community um, to give them accommodations um, and the fact that it's not perfect I, I can't help but I do know that I also have a special needs child that is always in that neighborhood um, or in my, in my neighborhood, walking around with headphones on. Um, he's 24, and he likes walking up and down those roads, and so his safety also needs to be considered as well. Um, and I just want to make sure if we're thinking about the possibility of reopening it, we, we look at what the future for that area looks like as far as all the development, whether it be down Far Road or even past there where they are, can now connect with their golf cart path. Um, I don't know that this young lady will have a job at Kroger. Hopefully she will or ever, right? That would be awesome. But I don't want to open up a, you know, a trail for somebody that in three months might be working somewhere else. Um, and then we are left holding the bag for all the future development and all the future carts coming through there. 
Um, we would like to keep our area safe. We'd like to keep it, you know, clear of dangerous driving. When we have swim meets, one lane's gone. I mean, completely gone because of the swim meet. And so it's dangerous. You know, and I think my kid walking up, walking through those, going to a swim meet, he didn't have a whole lot of space. We don't have uh, sidewalks. So that's something we have to keep in mind. Um, anyways, I could go on for a long time. We moved here in 2010 to be closer to my son's school, which actually is in Tyrone. So we understand. We moved here because that's where we wanted to be, and we wanted a car pass, so we moved to Peachtree City. Your time has Thank expired. You. Thank, Thank you. you for your comment. There are no additional speakers. Uh, agenda changes, Council? No. No. no minutes. A March fifth, twenty twenty four, City Council workshop mi minutes. March seventh, twenty twenty four, City Council meeting minutes. Can I get a motion? Madam Mayor, I make a motion that we accept March fifth, City Council workshop minutes, and the March seventh, City Council meeting minutes. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Consent agenda. A, fiscal year 2023 budget amendment, waste hauler franchise tax and hotel motel tax revenue. B, on-call staff for Kedron Fieldhouse, Kedron Aquatic Center Fieldhouse, part-time temporary employees. And C, SP Meditech stormwater facility maintenance agreement. Can I get a motion? So moved. A motion to approve. Second. Oh, do we have to say to approve? Please. Madam Mayor, I make a motion to approve the consent agenda as submitted. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Old agenda items, we have none. New agenda item 32402, Tennis Center Pro Shop Renovation Project. Good evening. Dave Borkowski, City Engineer. Here tonight to uh, recommend awarding a bid to uh, Crown Service Contractors for uh, renovating the Tennis Center Pro Shop building at the Tennis Center. If you're looking at the Tennis Center from, from the road, from Plantera Way, uh, there's two smaller buildings in front of the Tennis Center. One is a locker room and shower uh, facility, and then the other one is what we call the uh, Pro Shop building, because it used to be the old Pro Shop building back in the, back in the day. <coughs> this building is really in need of uh, repairs and renovations, uh, dire need of repairs. The roof's uh, leaking, and we need uh, some interior renovations as well. We contracted with CPL Architects to do the plans for this renovation, and uh, we put those out to bid. We received five bids. Uh, we had a really good, really good response for, for that bid. We did not pick the low bidder, as you'll see in the, the council memo. We had to go with the next highest bidder because the low bidder did not submit proper e-verify forms. Uh, they, they, they didn't follow directions in the bid. And in addition, after we uh, opened the bid, they realized that they missed some things. <laughs> they were about $70,000 off, they, they realized, um, when the bids were open. So they, with, they, they actually withdrew their bid. So we went to the next highest bidder, which was uh, Crown Development. We looked into their experience and references, and we even interviewed them, called them, talked to them and whatnot, and we found uh, their their bid to be acceptable. So we're recommending to award this, this bid to them for $467,105 and zero cents, if you can imagine that for a change. All right. Council? And oh, I'm sorry, this, go Sorry, this, uh, I wanted to mention that this is funded with ARP funds and there is adequate funding available for this. Okay, council questions? You said that CPL identified their own mistake? Pardon me, no. The, the architectural firm. CPL was the firm, the mistake was made by the bidder, not the architect. Okay, by the bidder. Good. Thank you. Thank You're any welcome. Other, any other questions, council? <coughs> No, other than a comment that uh, this is sadly needed for that building, Laura and I took a tour there and were both surprised that it was in such bad shape. Shocking. As a result of that, I'd like to make a motion that we accept. Approve. Or excuse me, approve. 03-24-02 um, Tennis Center Pro Shop Renovation Project with the contract being awarded to Crown in the amount of $467,105.00. Second. 
I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. New agenda item 32403 Field of Hope Turf Resurfacing Project. Uh, Mayor, uh, just really quick, as Kathy's coming to the podium, I just wanted to take a second to acknowledge that uh, Kathy Wilder has recently been promoted to our Parks and Recreation Director. Uh, she has had several years here in our organization, uh, and it, we did a nationwide search for a Recreation Director, and Kathy came out on top, and we are <coughs> extremely proud and lucky to have her in this position. So, sorry to embarrass you, Kathy, but thank you for Congratulations. your Congratulations. Good evening. Um, I am here to uh, talk about the Field of Hope surface replacement. Um, so the Field of Hope is located in the Peachtree Athletic Complex. That's where our baseball and soccer fields are located. Um, and it is home to our Challenger Baseball League, which is our adaptive baseball league that is part of the Little League program here in Peachtree City. Um, this location is also used by T-Ball as well. Um, it's unique in that it has an artificial uh, surface, so it's not a, our usual uh, dirt and grass field. Um, the surface there is about 20 years old, um, and as you can see in this picture, and I'll show you a few more, it's aging, um, it's showing signs of wear and tear, seams um, are separating, there's gaps uh, and cracking. Here's a few more pictures where you can see that surface coming apart. Um, and this is a Mondo surface, surface, so it's kind of a carpet-like material that was rolled out. Um, so what um, we would like to do is um, use artificial turf. So we would uh, completely demolish the existing surface, the asphalt, and uh, the Mondo surfacing on top, um, install a new drainage system underneath that that's adequate for the turf system. Underneath this is a shock pad, um, and then on top, the, the turf system with the sand infill. Um, so all the lines, base measurements, the field size would remain the same. Um, this would begin postseason, uh, end of May, uh, 2024, and um, it would take about eight weeks for construction. A little bit, just a little bit more about artificial turf since this is our first field that we would be converting. Um, lifespan is typically eight to 10 years. So at the end of this life cycle, to replace it, it's about 50% of the original install cost. Um, the drainage system would already be in place, so you're just replacing the top turf. Um, maintenance includes just some replenishing of the sand infill, um, occasional sweeping for getting rid of debris and trash. Um, and we do do annual safety inspection, so it's an impact test to make sure that we're within the sand standards of being safe to play on that surface. Um, and the maintenance and equipment are included in the bid. The maintenance equipment, not the actual maintenance, we would do that. Um, so Pond um, is the engineering firm that we use to design this. Um, so we have the design completed with the drainage and turf system. Um, and then we solicit the bids. We received three and we're recommending to award the um, bid to Advanced Sports Group for 340,000. Um, this was a CIP project, um, and originally um, we had about 300 and just under the $340,000 mark. We had to use some for um, the engineering design, so there's 292000 available in CIP, and we're asking um, for 47000 from CIP contingency. Thank you. And that's it. If you have any questions. Council? Yes. <coughs> I have a question. Sure. I did a, quite a few turfs, uh -huh. artificial turfs for Fulton County Schools. Mm -hmm. Now they were for older kids, mm -hmm. so they were soccer and football. And we ran into trouble towards the tail end of the year when some of the parents found out that the paint that we used to make the lines mm -hmm. was in fact uh, not approved, if you want to call it that, uh, by the, some of the artificial uh, companies. Mm -hmm. I guess it had lead-based paint. Oh, okay. So I don't expect too many little kids going face down into the stripes. Mm -hmm. Most of the years they're going to be playing on the field, mm -hmm. not out in, the, out in the grass. But has that ever been considered as a problem? 
Um, we want to make sure that whatever paint we are using on the surface, the, the actual markings are made with the turf. So the, the home bases and everything are going to be built in. Yeah, I understand yeah. that. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing out on the grass itself? No. Okay. Well, that would be my only concern. Thank you. Right. Any other questions? The only question I have, this is a not to exceed. So that's the maximum price we'll pay is $340,000 all mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Good job. All right. Can I get a motion? Oh, okay. Uh, Madam Mayor, I move that we approve <laughs> new agenda item 03-24-03, Field of Hope Turf Resurfacing Project for the amount not to exceed $340,000. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. New agenda item, new agenda item 32404, Gateway Bridge Landscape Project. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm uh, really happy to present this project to you all tonight. It's, um, it's For me, it's been a long time coming with this one and a couple of these other projects too, so it's nice to see that we're moving along on some of these things. Um, a little summary of this area um, to give some context. The bridge and paths here, this is the bridge that was uh, constructed uh, near McDuff Parkway on the way to Noonan on Highway 54 in 2021. It was completed uh, with the pass going up to it and, and back down on each side. However, when this project was done, landscaping was never done with it. Uh, really just some grass was planted and that was about it. The current conditions of it now in 2024, there's already some erosion concerns out there. Um, we've, we've seen erosion happening on those hills which is a concern and also the grass uh, that was planted has started to overgrow and it's really difficult for our crews to actually maintain these hills because they're so steep. Um, so the grasses are kind of getting unruly out there. You see in the picture there uh, what it looks like a few weeks ago and then I'm showing a couple more here what it looks like out there. So kind of going back to the master plan when we talk about the Peachtree City Standard, is, the, is this it? Um, with, with the look out there. So what, what we did was we went to a, a landscape architect, All South Landscaping, they completed the design for us and you kind of see the final design there. Uh, the left side picture is the south side, the right side picture is the north side. Uh, the plan is to remove all the current vegetation out there, install new plants and landscaping as designed on these plans. It totals about eight acres uh, worth of landscaping. It's a big area. Um, the uh, proposal also included a two-year maintenance agreement, so the winning bidder of this project is also going to be responsible for maintaining this area for two years. Uh, that's to really protect us for once that two-year period's over, all of this landscaping should be well-established and should be well-maintained by that point. So when city crews take it over, it should be pretty easy to take care of, and that goes into our objectives with this. As staff was, we want to prevent further erosion of that area we want to select the appropriate plants for long-term maintenance. So we wanted, we wanted to beautify the area, which is number three, but we also wanted to make sure the area was going to be low maintenance for our crews. So make it pretty, but also make it easy to maintain because it's such a big area. Um, and going back to the beautify part on number three, 43,000, this is according to GDOT traffic counts, 43,000 vehicles, which is bigger than the population of our city, go under that bridge every, every single day. Um, so, you know, we want to we show that we care about our city. So here's some uh, concept, conceptual designs of what it might look out there. One thing to notice is the uh, inner area here is actually, it's flat in these pictures, but that is the steep bowl areas. So it's not going to look exactly like this. It's going to be on hills. Um, but this is an idea of what the plants look like. Also, uh, word of caution is this is, you know, you see the trees are mature here, everything's established, everything looks nice and pristine. It's, you know, it'll never look exactly like they mock it up in the drawings. Um, and it'll take a few years, multiple years to actually for those trees to get to those heights. Um, but it will look better. I mean, it'll look better right off the bat. And then as these things age, it should start to look more like this. So here's just some more pictures of the approach to the bridge. Got some uh, uh, love grass going up through there. Some more mock-ups. Through here. 
All right, and then finally, uh, so same as the other ones, we competitively bid this out. We received four qualified bids, so that's a good thing. Uh, the lowest bid was with Brightview Landscape Services. Uh, staff re is recommending to award the bid to them uh, an amount not to exceed $530,272.78. And the item is funded through our SPOS 2017 project number nine, which is that gateway bridge project. Um, and there will be, uh, some of the balance will have to be covered by uh, SPLOS contingency reallocated from uh, unallocated funds in SPLOS to cover it. And I'm okay. here to answer any questions. Council questions? I would just tell you, Justin, I've never seen a project actually completed the way it looks on a, on a rendering. <laughs> right. After, yes. After 30 years, they I know, never look the same. I know you know, but I want to caveat it for everybody else. <laughs> uh, one quick question. There's been some, we had discussions with the city manager when he gave us the two by twos that there was some concern by A. a. Abbey that they didn't make the bid. They wanted to know why they, we couldn't give more attention to city owned companies. Mm -hmm. And he gave us a pretty good justification for that. I think for the purpose of the city, that may be something we at least make a comment about. Would, mm -hmm. would the manager or? Yeah, so right now we went through the competitive bid process on this and the, the lowest bid was selected for right. this and the company that you speak of was actually higher uh, to some percentage. Um, the, the city does not have a provision in its procurement code right now that talks about uh, local owned companies, uh, you know, being the preface when it comes to the bids that we put out there. If that is something that council is interested in doing, uh, we can certainly come back and take a look at you know, adding that language to our procurement code. But at this point right now, the, the procurement code, that's hard to say three times in a row, uh, that actually um, it is dictated based on the, on the bid specs and, you know, looking at the lowest bid and then putting it out competitively for everybody to have access to. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. You're very welcome. Council, any other questions? I have one question. Just, Justin, would you clarify just so that everybody knows, because we sat through a, a more thorough presentation. Sure. But, um, that, the, that the, there are hills and what looks like grass is not really grass. It's not grass that's gonna need to be mowed. It's, yeah. it's more of a ground cover kind of options. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Because yeah, obviously with the steep hills, maintenance is definitely an right, issue. Right, that's what we're trying to get away from. Right. Uh, this is juniper, like it's actually all juniper. Yeah. So juniper is good for hills like this because it, um, it establishes the root systems to keep the erosion at bay. And it, but it also, the way it grows, it doesn't really need to be trimmed really at all. I mean, you trim it sometimes, um, but especially when it's in areas where it's not encroaching on any roads or paths or anything, you can let it grow. Um, the deer will help you out. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the juniper was, I will say personally, I'm not a huge fan of juniper, but like it has to be, you know, it's good for hills like this. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, it'll look good and it'll, it won't go wild. It'll it'll be easy to maintain. It'll grow naturally in a good way. That looks that looks that stays looking good even without high maintenance. All right. Any other questions? No. Can I get a Can I get a motion? Madam Mayor, I'll make a motion that we approve the award of the bid for the Gateway Bridge Landscape Project to Brightview Landscape Services for a total amount not to exceed five hundred and thirty thousand two hundred and seventy-two dollars and seventy-eight cents. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Public hearing 32405 new alcohol license, Mama Noki <coughs> at 2100 Highway 54 East. Mama Noki. Yes, and I will read the protocol prior to beginning. When the public hearing is open, members of council will become hearers. No action on their part is in order until the mayor declares the hearing complete. First, city staff will present the item. The mayor will then allow a total of 10 minutes from members of the public to comment. No individual member of the public will be given more than five minutes to speak. Time limits may only be extended by a majority vote of council. Prior to closing the public hearing, city staff and the public will be given the opportunity to ask questions. When the mayor is assured that the in input is complete, the public hearing shall be ended and the council may then debate the issue and render a decision. 
All speakers from the public are asked to follow these rules. One, please wait to be recognized by the mayor. Two, come to the microphone and state your name and neighborhood prior to making remarks. Three, keep individual remarks under five minutes and please do not repeat others' comments. And four, address all comments to the mayor. Thank you. So good evening, mayor and council. Um, tonight we have a public hearing for a new alcohol license for business located at 2100 Highway 54 East. Uh, this is a, in the plaza next to Brandon's Package Store. It's a new sushi restaurant. Um, it's also in the plaza with Upscale and the Goodwill Donation Center across the street from Dairy Queen. Um, the applicant as well as the location meet all requirements. And if this uh, alcohol license was approved, it would include uh, beer, wine, and distilled spirits, which would have a plus a uh, positive budget impact of $5,000 for that license and $500 for Sunday sales. Any questions? Thank you. At this time, I will open the public hearing. Is there anybody who wishes to speak in favor? Sir? I believe the owner is uh, Alvin, and I know him. His uh, restaurant and his sushi is actually excellent and I would be for, for him to actually to be approved. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in favor? Seeing none, is there anyone who wishes to speak in opposition? <coughs> Seeing none, I hereby close the public hearing. Council, concerns or questions? Can I get a motion? No. I, have, I have one concern. I've tried to get into that place twice. <laughs> <laughs> I have my wife and I go there. We went early one time to try to get in early, and the hour, the the wait was still 90 minutes to get in. It's packed, and that tells you something about maybe the quality, as that gentleman has just just talked about. That's the only comment I have, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Can I get a motion, Madam Mayor? I'll make a motion to accept 03-24 dish to, to approve. approve. Uh, to, excuse to approve. me, to approve. It's a terrible habit, I'm telling you. Uh, to approve the new alcohol license for Momonoke. Um, that's it. All right, can I get a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Uh, council staff topics. We'll start with Bob Kerno. Yes, thank you again, uh, Mayor and Council. I just wanted to take another opportunity to introduce uh, uh, a new employee with the city. Uh, this gentleman is sitting over here uh, to my right. Uh, his name is Tyler Runyon. He's our new executive director of the Convention and Visitor Bureau. Uh, Tyler comes to us from the Atlanta Airport District Convention and <coughs> Visitors Bureau. He has a tremendous amount of uh, knowledge in the uh, back and background in the industry. And again, this is another opportunity for us to bring on new talent with a great outlook for the CVB, and I could not be more happy or proud to have Tyler join us. So I just wanted to welcome Tyler and say thank you for thank being you. here this evening. Thank you. Um, on another topic, can you update us as to everything that's dug up in front of City Hall? Sure, I had a feeling that one was coming. Um, so if you notice when we were doing the wet down of the um, rescue vehicle out there, uh, we've been doing a lot of work around City Hall in, in as far as um, maintenance is concerned. We started with uh, sealing, pressure cleaning, sealing, and repainting the City Hall building. Uh, in addition, now we're on the landscaping side of it. So what you see out there is actually landscaping done. We had some, so I'm, I'm from South Florida, so you know, pardon me, I'm not sure what those are called that we were dug up, the root balls, I called them sticks. Crepe myrtle. Um, crepe myrtles. We had this conversation out there. Um, from a maintenance perspective, it looks as though the sticks, um, you know, were were um, were no longer with us as far as living is concerned. So we had to remove those, and then they have a significant root ball under there. So some of the landscaping that was there needed to be dug up, and we're going to be putting that back with again consistent theme of keeping it low maintenance, but um, a lot more um, pretty looking with some colors. Wonderful. Looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to mention that our next meeting, typically we meet first and third Thursdays of every month in the evening times, 6.30 p.m. In April, we will meet April 4th as usual, 6.30 p.m. And the second meeting in April, which is April 18th, will be at 9.30 in the morning. 
And then again in May, the first meeting of May will be in the evening as usual. The second meeting in May, which is May 16th, will be a Thursday, we'll meet at 9.30 in the morning. And again in June, the second meeting of the month, June 20th, will be held at 9.30 in the morning. And the focus is on helping us see if we can have more voices heard and more people have the opportunity to come in during the day. So we'll try that three times and, and then we'll have a chat about it. So we'll see you as usual April 4th and then on April 18th we'll be meeting at 9.30 a.m. Council, any other council staff topics? No, I'm good. Thank you, Ann. Uh, do we have executive session? Yes, we need to discuss personnel in executive session. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? We are in executive session.